Welcome to Washington Unplugged. I'm John Dickerson. Our coverage of the tragedy in Tucson continues today with Politico's Roger Simon and CBS News Chief White House Correspondent Chip Reed. President Obama took on the role of comforter-in-chief last night, speaking at a memorial for the six victims of the Arizona shooting. He encouraged the crowd of over 14,000 and the entire country not to, quote, use this tragedy as one more occasion to turn on one another. He also had some good news to share. Take a look. Our hearts are broken by their sudden passing. Our hearts are broken. And yet, our hearts also have reason for fullness. Our hearts are full of hope and thanks for the 13 Americans who survived the shooting, including the Congresswoman many of them went to see on Saturday. I have just come from the University Medical Center, just a mile from here, where our friend Gabby courageously fights to recover, even as we speak. Uh, and I want to tell you, uh, her husband Mark is here, and he allows me the, to share this uh, with you. Uh, right after we went to visit, a few minutes after we left her room and some of her colleagues for, from Congress were in the room, Gabby opened her eyes for the first time. Gabby opened her eyes for the first time. Roger, the president was doing a lot of things here. He was talking about the victims, the heroes. He was delivering a medical update, and he was also talking about the nation. How did he do? Uh, I thought he did extremely well, uh, and it was a difficult speech to deliver. Uh, like most reporters, I get an advanced copy and I read it quickly and then I wait for the president to speak. But on paper, it was written for a much more solemn setting. It was written for the National Cathedral. Yeah. Um, instead, it was 14,000 kids in a gymnasium, basically. And no one expected, I don't think, whistling and hooting and cheering. The president managed to carry it off using the same language he managed to use the crowd appropriately to get some serious points across. We had to come together as a nation. Some very emotional points across, as the one that we've just uh, heard, and some kind of message of uh, hope. But there was also a stern message to the country. He said, we cannot even begin to talk about what divides us because we're basically unworthy of it. We're not prepared to have this discussion without indulging in more harsh rhetoric, and therefore we can't start it yet. I want to get back to that question about unworthiness in a, in a second, though. Chip, let me ask you, was, what was the White House expecting? And when they had the speech in their hands, walked into the venue, uh, did they know it was going to have this mix of, you know, memorial and pep rally? I think they probably figured it out when the president walked in and there was a scream that went up like I've never heard before. It really was extraordinary because I think like Roger, I and Robert Gibbs said today, he too were expecting a much more solemn occasion. In fact, I counseled uh, executives in New York that the speech would probably be the predicted 16 to 18 minutes because I didn't see many applause lines in it. Well, it went on for 35 minutes largely because of the applause and the president got pumped up in a way, a kind of in a rally-esque kind of way. Way that I don't think anybody really expected. It really did read. Uh, Roger's exactly right. I was going to say that same thing. This was really written for the National Cathedral, and it uh, just came off very differently. But uh, I think the general consensus is the president really uh, pulled it off here. And you know, uh, there have been all those complaints about the president in the past, calling him Spock-like, emotionally detached, remote. I think those days are over, John. Let's take a, qu a quick look here at a clip of the president and one of the things he was trying to do in the speech. Their actions, their selflessness, poses a challenge to each of us. It raises a question of what, beyond prayers and expressions of concern, is required of us going forward. How can we honor the fallen? How 
can we be true to their memory? Roger, this, it felt like to me, was the hinge of the speech. Uh, the president memorialized those who'd fallen, had the heroes, but then he got to your point about unworthiness, which is that their memory calls on the country to, to raise their game a little. Is that the way yeah. you said? Uh, he, he said, basically, it, it, if we use this as just another excuse to beat each other over the head, um, that uh, right-wing or left-wing rhetoric led to this shooting, then there will be no progress. And that uh, as long as we're trapped in a blame game, there's going to be no healing. Now, it was very effective during the speech of a master speaker. Um, the trouble, I must say, to be realistic, which the president avoided mentioning, perhaps because he thought everyone knew it, is that this is a very violent country that the murder of six people at one time is not a huge headline most of the time. It happens. This time, it happened to a U.S. Congresswoman. And that is what made it different. That is why the president was there. But if we can't make this violence the subject of a national conversation without it affecting a, a uh, lawmaker, then we're probably going to fail in what the president wants us to do. Chip, tell us a little bit about the president's hands-on approach to this speech. It seemed, as you, as you pointed out, I th your point about Spock was, uh, was that these weren't just words pasted on an event. These came right from the person who was speaking them. That's right. Uh, the White House has always said that on the big speeches, especially the ones that come from the heart, the president writes somewhere in the vicinity of 80 to 90 percent of the words. He wrote the first draft. Uh, he then sent it off to a very talented speechwriter who uh, worked on it, and then the president got it back and he went through it. You know, there's a famous picture on the White House website, I think it's still there, of one page of a speech that the president was working on, and it's just completely covered with ha his handwriting and his changes. On these big spe uh, speeches, it is very much hands-on. In the end, it is his words. You'd hate to have him as an editor looking oh, yes. at that picture. <laughs> yes. it's, um, it's, it's terrifying. Was there any thought in the White House that you picked up um, about balance here? There were some people saying that he should repeat what he did after the Fort Hood shooting, which was essentially give the top half of the speech he gave, which is talk about the victims, the heroes, and be done with it, not try to make that pivot and use the, the moment to make a larger message to speak to the larger to the, speak to the larger message. Was there any sense that he wasn't going to do that? No, I mean, they did tell us ahead of time most of it was going to be memorializing the victims and the heroes. But uh, I think even in the very beginning, on the day this shooting occurred, the president spoke at the White House, and he made clear at the time that not only was this an unspeakable tragedy, but that also this was a time for the nation to come together. And I think from the very beginning, and I think that's one reason uh, he really has put behind this idea of his being emotionally detached, because from the very first day, from just hours after this happened, he was already out there making both points. One, what a horrible tragedy this is, and let's uh, uh, mourn and celebrate the lives of these people and celebrate the heroes, and also make that hinge, as you called it, make that turn to uh, how do we honor uh, their memory and their heroism? What do we do to uh, make, a more, uh, make for a more civil debate in this country? Roger, I'll finish with you, which is the, you mentioned it's not, uh, not likely to change the violent culture of America. What's your guess on if there's any uh, improvement in the rhetoric in the... I think there are a few hopeful signs today. People are, are calling for a, an end to sticks and stones for a week, uh, toning down uh, the rhetoric um, just for a few days to see how it works. Now, there are political and and journalistic forces working against that. We all know what gets high ratings on talk TV. We all know what motivates um, lawmakers who seek to be reelected. But if there is, and I sense there is, a certain amount of pub public outrage at the behavior of all of us, the media, lawmakers, ourselves, in just how we've been conducting ourselves in the past 12 months, that might have an effect. 
finally, I have to ask you about Sarah Palin because her name has been associated with this from the day the shooting occurred. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people believe wrongly that she shouldn't even be in the conversation. Anyway, she put out a message yesterday morning, the day this president was speaking, defending herself, also defending the, the rough and tumble of American dialogue. How does she emerge from yesterday uh, as a political figure? Very poorly, I think. I, I thought it, at one point that she was going to do what Ronald Reagan did when he left office, uh, when he left the governorship of California, and use those months to go around the country, make speeches, espouse a political philosophy, uh, build support uh, within her party and outside the party. Instead, she's fallen into some kind of uh, trap uh, where her personal anger seems to be driving her. It was terrible timing to release her statement on the same day as the president's. You can't beat the president in a speech contest. And also, she didn't want it to be a bookend, which almost every journalist treated it today. Her use of violent language and blood libel versus the president's heartbreaking image of a nine-year-old girl splashing in a puddle in heaven. That's the difference between someone who gets elected president and someone who merely wants to be elected president. Okay, Roger Simon of Politico. Chip Reed on the White House lawn, thanks so much. One of the few bright spots of the past week is the story of Daniel Hernandez, the hero intern credited with saving Congresswoman Gifford's life. Kelly Hartung joins me now with that story. Thanks, Kaylee. John. You know, Daniel was someone who was particularly moved at the news last night from President Obama of the Congresswoman's condition. He told the CBS Early Show this morning that he was elated. Um, you know, he's been labeled a hero by the media, by Gifford's doctors, and last night by President Obama and the president of his university. But he says it's a label he doesn't deserve. Among the many heroes this week was one of our students, Daniel Hernandez, Jr., With no prepared remarks, Hernandez told a crowd of nearly 15,000 and millions watching on television that he was no hero. I appreciate the sentiment. I must humbly reject the use of the word hero because I am not one. Hernandez took his moment in the spotlight to honor his own heroes. So I thank you for this opportunity, but I say we must reject the title of hero and reserve it for those who deserve it. And those who deserve it are the public servants and the first responders and the people who have made sure that they have dedicated their life to taking care of others. And with that, I thank you all. President Obama respectfully disagreed with Hernandez's humility. We are grateful to Daniel Hernandez, a volunteer in Gabby's office. And Daniel, I'm sorry, you may deny it, but we've decided you are a hero because you ran through the chaos to minister to your boss and tended to her wounds and helped keep her alive. It is hard to find a word other than hero to describe Hernandez's actions. Doctors have credited him, you know, holding her head in his hands, applying pressure to that wound as literally saving her life. And he also uh, gave advice to others about how to tend to the other's wound in the middle of all this Absolutely. chaos. Absolutely. He had, you know, elementary medical training to be a nurse's assistant, and he sprung into action when it was needed. Amazing. Kelly Hartung, thanks so much. Well, that's it for Washington Unplugged. Stay with CBSNews.com today for continuing special coverage. I'm John Dickerson. Have a good day.